Welcome to whiskey.com, where fine spirits meet. Today we talk about the production of single malt whiskey. Part one, there's more to come. And uh, I call it uh, whiskey once and today. Uh, the good olden days when everything was worse. The production of single malt whiskey uh, received an improvement over the decades or centuries, which is quite impressive. Uh, the old distilleries are still present at their original location, the old buildings, the old stones, the granite, still there, but the inside of the distillery changed a lot over the time, even when the production processes kept the same, roughly. Um, the location of a distillery is typically at the bottom of a hill, close to a river, and close to a water source. Um, the water for the whiskey itself comes from a source, most often located uh, at the slope of a hill, where the water from the hill uh, comes out of, uh, yeah of the soil by itself, uh, that you do not have to dig into the ground to get water and try to get it out and pump it out. It was quite uh, difficult in former times to pump water uh, out of the, bot uh, of the soil. So uh, this is the best location of the distillery, the water from the river you need for the cooling of the production of the alcohol vapors during distillation. You need a lot of cold water to cool them down again, so the location close to a river is very important. The distillery itself was located mm, in respect to the gravity. The corn, the barley, uh, came to the distillery by horse, carriage or ox, and uh, they drove it up the mountain to the most upper part of the distillery and there the production process began and then the uh, intermediate steps in the production went down from one location to another so the flow went with gravity. You never had to pump any liquid up the hill though it went down and down and down and uh, the warehouses where the whiskey matured for years and years were located close to the river, either for a shipment uh, with, a, with a boat or uh, the, uh, the street along the river uh, was used for transportation. Then, um, in the middle of the 19th century, the railway came up and came also to the islands in Scotland and then the whisky was yeah, two hours away from the capital of Edinburgh. And then in this time, Alfred Banar, not Christian Banar, no, Alfred Banar, born 1837, and died 1918. Uh, he traveled uh, the highlands and wrote a book about his travel around 1885, 1887, and it's called The Whiskey Distilleries of the United Kingdom. This is not the original book. It would cost an awful lot of several hundreds, even thousands of euros. Uh, no, this one is a reprint. And uh, in this reprint, there are also wonderful pictures. Uh, this is of the Milton distillery in Keith. Milton, the former distillery, uh, Glen Keith is, I think, the successor of the Milton distillery. And here, Caledonian distillery. Long gone. Marrowbone Lane Distillery, also long gone. So there's a lot of distilleries in here. Uh, there is These reprints are available between 30 and 60 euros, dollars, pounds. Search for them. In Google you will be successful to get one. Um, and he wrote this book in 1885-1887 and he was one of the first yeah, alcoholic beverage journalists. 
And he traveled by railway into the highlands and from the railway station to the distillery he took a cap, a horse cap. Um, the production uh, cycle uh, was went with the year. When the harvest was brought in in autumn, then the production and distilling started. And during the cold and rainy winter, uh, you had enough water to cool your stills and to uh, liquefy the uh, alcohol vapors. And uh, in the spring, uh, then the uh, the workmen uh, had their labor on the fields for growing uh, <laughs> the barley. Uh, and when and over summer, when there was very few water left in the rivers and in the sources, then production stopped completely in former times. Today, the production cycle runs completely around the year, only at several places where water is very scarce. There, there's a, uh, a gap for four to eight weeks in summer. And most distilleries take a gap, a break, in summer, about three or four weeks uh, for maintenance purposes, change something, some uh, piping, some motors, some heating. So there's a lot of work to do in a constantly running distillery where you do not want to lose a shift and 3,000 or 5,000 liters of cask strength whiskey. No, you won't like that. The start of the production process begins with the malting. So you have the barley and this barley is turned into sugar, maltosis. And uh, every small beer brewery in the town close to you, <laughs> where you live, was able in former times to produce beer. And the mayor said, oh, don't pollute the water in the river. Uh, on Tuesdays, we will produce beer on Thursdays. So there you took the water for your beer and there the, uh, the barley was soaked with water. Then the germination process started on the malting floors and this uh, barley was spread on the malting floors uh, between 10 and 20 centimeters high. And in this malting floor, uh, the malting process started and converted starch into sugar. And this production isn't stable. So on the top where the, uh, the water evaporates quite fast, the malting is not that fast as in the middle where it's wetter and in the very bottom where it's cold from the stone floor there, uh, the, the speed is also lower so you had to turn the malt very often and this was a tedious work and the man got a, a hump so it's called a monkey shoulder because they had to turn uh, the barley uh, every six hours or so and this was a very hard labor ton, five tons of malt, you know what you have done. Uh, then they changed over to saladin boxes where you fill a concrete, uh, a concrete box uh, in the floor uh, with tons of barley soaked with water and then uh, you go through it with electric uh, turnover equipment where you mix the barley. But also you need a lot of workforce to get the uh, the ready, the finished barley out of these concrete boxes. Today only a handful of distilleries still have their own maltings and all but one use it only for uh, tourists, for as a tourist attraction. Um, the only distillery which produces all of its barley itself is Springbank. Uh, and all the other uh, barley comes from yeah, huge production facilities where the barley is turned into malt by gigantic drums which turn and have a humid uh, atmosphere in it. Oh. Yeah. Some distilleries uh, 
turn back and say, well, we like to produce our whiskey with local barley, as the Brichletti local barley I tested already. Um, but the amount of barley the Scots, Scots need is so huge. They, have, they drink a lot of beer and they have all this whiskey for export. So they import a lot of uh, barley from the continent where the, yeah, where the barley grows much better, faster and cheaper. Uh, today they also experiment in Scotland with the old uh, barley. Uh, what's called tribes, no, <laughs> uh, and the old barley like the Aran beer. So this is a barley uh, which was used already with the Picts. Yeah. Um, some whiskies have a smoky character and this smoke uh, results from burnt uh, peat. And the mosses in the highlands, um, they grow with a millimeter per year and they are sometimes three meters high, so 3,000 years old. And there the people since ever uh, dig their peat and uh, burn their peat. And this burning of peat in your chimney at home is an awful pollution. If you smell the villages where every chimney brings out the, the, the fine dust, the respirable dust of this peat. You can smell it everywhere. Uh, that's not healthy. No, not at all. Uh, if you look back to the old times in London where the fog was very thick, it comes from the coal which was burned in every household uh, and then uh, the water from the Thames they, the water vapor from the Thames uh, uh, condensed at this fine dust and gave this, the fog or smog uh, which stayed in London for weeks. Today we have these big uh, malting facilities which have also a closed peat smoke circulation in it and they use a fraction of the peat that was used before in these old kiln firings. There, you made your fire with a, a peat below the spreaded barley, and uh, the peat smoke goes through the barley, dries it for two days, and the water vapor comes out of the pagoda-shaped top of the, of the kiln, and you smell it everywhere, and everything around it is black from this dust was very awful um, and uh, today they show these maltings but only for a fraction of their production um, and most of it is gone already and the distilleries are painted white now <laughs> no longer national uh, granite gray <laughs> which turns over to black uh, from the dust and to black from the fungus uh, fungi at the warehouses uh, and these fungi, uh, they live from the alcohol vapors, from the angel share, from the warehouse. So all distilleries were black, really black. Um, people say don't take the, uh, the peat from the mosses in Scotland, uh, but uh, the amount the distillery industry is taking from the mosses is much less than grows every year. So the, the areas of the mosses are quite big and the distilleries need a very little because of these closed uh, peat smoke uh, circulations in the big malting facilities. Um, after the production of the malt you have to grain it. Uh, they do produce a grist. We have a grain mill and uh, then you become a grist. It's not as fine as flour uh, and it's not as coarse as uh, a, a, a pressed corn. No, it's in between. It's called grist and uh, if it's too fine everything will will stick and, and, and uh, the water will not flow any longer. If it's too coarse, you won't get the sugar, the malt sugar 
out of the grist. Uh, today, uh, those mills uh, are turned, uh, are running on electric motors, but in former times you had big water wheels and you had to uh, mill <laughs> your barley when the water was there, after rain. And you had to mill enough for the next production processes. And if you made too much, then, mm, well, <laughs> you get mold in your barley. And also on the, the malting floors, if the man had this monkey shoulder and the arm hurt, he wasn't good enough in turning, he went slower and forgot a piece of it, and then you got the mold in it also. So the production just in time today uh, brings higher quality than in former times. And then uh, from the mill they had a they put the grist into sacks and uh, put it with a barrow uh, to the mash tun. Today they are conveyors electrically driven and there is a uh, an automatic mixture of the grist with hot water and everything is fine today. In former times they put it into the hot water and then they had wooden paddles and steer inside the mesh tun and uh, they got uh, burnt fingers and uh, yes, <laughs> the good olden days where everything was worse. Um, the mesh tuns were open on the upside for steering inside the tons and so uh, there was a lot of wasted energy. You heat a lot below the mesh ton uh, for keeping the temperature, for getting the malt sugars out of the grist. Uh, then around the turn of the century they added uh, motors uh, with mixtures for turning over uh, automatically then they could uh, cover the mesh tons for keeping the temperature and today uh, you have modern lauter tons which run completely automatically. Several intakes of water, several, uh, several uh, uh, exact temperatures you have to keep for special times. Yeah, uh, The yield, the output of sugar out of a ton of barley is much higher today. So, I've spoken long enough for the first part and in the next part I talk about the fermentation and the distillation. Thank you for watching. Here you find the link for part 2 tomorrow and stay tuned. And if you like this video, give me a thumbs up.